I'm Richard Gerhardt, an intellectual property attorney specializing in patents, trademarks, and copyrights. <laughs> and I'm Elizabeth <laughs> Gerhardt, not an attorney, uh, but I work at Gerhardt Law doing the marketing, and I also have my own startup. Welcome to Passage to Profit, everybody, the show that's about innovation, small businesses, and the intellectual property that helps them flourish. So tonight on our show, we have a special treat, Daryl Evans, who is an investor and business growth advisor, and he's co-founder of Yokel Local Internet Marketing, and he's also host of the MindShift podcast. Wow. So we also have a couple of great presenters after him. One is Ron Richard, medical device inventor and consultant. So if you've been in the hospital or at the doctor's mm-hmm. office and you're like, they really need a new device to do that. And I've got like just the idea. A new bedpan or something. <laughs> He's the guy to go to. Um, and his company is inventingstartstoday.com and he has a book too. And then for all of you dog lovers out there and all of you dog sitters, and I, anyway, half the country at least, Right. Beth Harriman has Do Loop, which is a dog poop picker up or aid, I guess I should say. Um, so that's one reason why I don't have a dog is because I just can't stand the sense of picking that. What was that up. Jerry Seinfeld joke? Oh yeah. Who really runs the world? Uh, look who walks behind who and look who's picking up who's poop. So I, <laughs> dogs, so the dogs, are, dogs are, 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 are it. So, and of course we have Kenya Gibson here with us today, our media maven from iHeart. She'll be doing her power move segment. So, so you found something that so you feel compelled. Start, you I feel compelled discuss. this to share. I feel compelled to share this with everybody. I was online and I found this site on Yahoo. That was about Twitter owns. So people owning each other on Twitter And this one just made me like hysterical. So I did not know this, but Pope Francis has an account at Pontifex. Does everybody know who Pope Francis is? Like what he does? And is he like like a singer or something? (laughs) Well, when he's in church chanting, (laughs) doing the mass, probably. So we all know Pope Francis is like one of the top religious leaders on the planet, right? Right. So Pope Francis posts on his Twitter account in 2015, Christians and Muslims are brothers and sisters, and we must act as such. And so somebody That's nice. Yes. That's a nice sentiment coming yeah, so, from a world leader. Yeah. Yeah. So somebody else answers him by saying, why don't you ask, and this is verbatim, mum slims to convert to Christianity? Please read John 14, 6, to which somebody else replies, did you seriously just ask the Pope to read the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> uh, it's, <laughs> so yeah, I guess that's. Uh, I, I I wonder what the Pope thought if he even saw it. I don't know. <laughs> well, but I, I, I have be... I have a question for you though. How did God create the universe? Angel funding. <laughs> <laughs> so, I thought the Twitter own was better. <laughs> yeah, well, you would. I thought mine was better. <laughs> so anyway. Um, Without further ado, oh, yeah. oh, ado, IP in the news. Right, right, I'm right. Two so things at once. I know we're we're just going at the speed of sound here. Oh, I found that paper I was looking for. Um, <laughs> so today, Richard's roundtable is all about pets. Wait, uh, we no, the IP in the news is about pets. Isn't that what I said? No, you said Richard's roundtable is all about pets. All right. Richard's a little flustered yeah. because of the road. No. So I mean, let's I'm, start I'm, that. I'm a little flustered because of the all of the jokes that we started with. So, so, so IP in the news is about uh, a new vehicle control system that has been patented or it has an application pending. No, it, it, the patent issued in February. Oh, I thought you said it wasn't issued. It's right here. Okay. Look so, at the top. <laughs> do you know that? I've, I've spent I've spent thirty <laughs> years practicing patent law, so no trust me, I know what I'm talking about. All right, it no, no, no. On All right, it issued. You said before it was published, so <laughs> okay, okay. Just let me finish. It's my okay? fault. My fault. Well, you just so anyway, it's a vehicle, uh, a new way to control your vehicle for pets. So if you want to leave your dog or your cat, or I guess your baby 
In, no, in, you never in, leave a child in the car. Okay. Are you crazy? Don't leave your child in the car. <laughs> Not even an eleven year old. But it, it it has a key fob that allows you to up, you know, raise and lower the windows, control the temperature in the car, and this way the car is pet friendly. Uh, you can open the back, uh, the back uh, of the car if you want, uh, and so it's really neat. And then there's also an alert system that there's a light that shines so that if people uh, walk by, they know that your 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 animal is like being taken care of monitored. through this monitored through this system. Right. So it was issued to Ford Motor Company. Um, the name of the patent is System and Method for Creating a Pet Friendly Automotive Environment. And on the key fob for the car, and also I think an app on your phone, is a little paw print. So if you press that on the key fob, you can get into all the controls for taking care of your dog that you left in your car. And so you can turn down the windows and you can select the front or the back. And then you can select like the percentage that you want the window to go down <laughs> or up. You can open the trunk. You can open the sunroof. Uh, you can tilt the rear seats, I guess, if you want. <laughs> and on and to... on we go. No, 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 so... no, wait, wait. There's a... You can play audio. So you can play the radio or the MP3. Passage to profit for your dog. And then they have the rear air conditioning <laughs> button too. So that so... way you can feel safe about your pet. And there's like a monitor that the pet wears too. So you can see how, how your pet is doing. So whoever invented this must really love dogs. I, I well, you know, pets are, pet products are like the thing today. So the, it doesn't surprise me the Ford that still, the Ford's getting into it. Right. They still have to put it in the car. So the patent just issued, but I haven't seen a car with this yet. So yeah. But if they do put this in their cars, I think they're going to sell a lot more cars. Yes. Personally, I think so. And 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 don't put your kid in there. That that was really not a, a serious suggestion, folks. So. <laughs> anyway, Richard's Roundtable. Uh, and so I guess I'd like to get some feedback on everything that we just covered. So uh, nobody needs go in this order. To, yeah, I'll go in this order. And there's no need to point out that I did not know that patent was not that patent was issued. It was it was not an application where right? we already. It says okay. It right there. okay, so Daryl, what are your thoughts? So I think it's very interesting. Thanks for having me on the show, first of all. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity. Happen, having uh, been a dog lover since uh, six years old, five years old, was, I think we got our first dog. Um, I've always struggled with taking my dog in the car somewhere because you never know when you're going to have to stop. And I live in Las Vegas. So oh. uh, you, you don't do very much in the summer. With You don't want to be in the car in Las Vegas, even when it's running with air conditioning sometimes. <laughs> so yeah. I, I think it's an interesting concept um yeah I, I don't i think with anything someone will do that and then forget to turn on the device you know it's <laughs> it, it, so it's it's to me it like let's take care of our pets the same way we take care of our kids at least our dog has five beds in the house i've got one if that tells you anything <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's uh, interesting you know it's innovative great yeah. great great so um beth what are your thoughts I'm kind of with Daryl. I am all all kinds of actually nervous about that. <laughs> I'm hearing it. I I think it's wild that they thought about it. I think it's wild that they've um, patented it and gotten a patent. But I can just see people doing that with their kids. And also, when you think I've been trying to be very eco conscious with my stuff and having like cars running, you know, because you can't have a turned off car. Um, and just the exhaust and stuff like that and 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 people forgetting their pets i i don't know <laughs> yeah I, it, it, you know now to... that you think about it it could be a little bit risky unless there was some sort of fail safe or something right so uh you know maybe that the trunk opens under certain conditions or something well, i didn't read the whole patent so some of that might yeah. be in the specification and, right? and I... you you brought a patent onto the show that you didn't read no <laughs> just looked at the pictures <laughs> anyway <laughs> right <laughs> nothing like an in-depth legal analysis <laughs> i'm not a lawyer so <laughs> ron what are your thoughts well i think it's interesting i worked with fitbit for several uh, years on projects associated with uh, automobile manufacturers that were looking at monitoring uh, biometrics so heart rate drowsy driving falling asleep while driving so this is just a <clears throat> another step in the evolution i think of you know, giving people features in automobiles that, um, you know, allow them to, like you say, safely take care of a pet while they're in the grocery store for a short little trip. But 
my concern is like you pointed out and you were kidding and joking but i just hope people don't use this to leave their kids in a car yeah it's well, like this is going to be safe by, by the way you 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 talked about mechanisms for sleeping in cars why would people want to sleep in cars well well they don't actually i'm the I'm the board of director or chairman for a company that we monitor truck drivers. And oh, the, so they we're get always a electric shock or <laughs> no, nothing like that. There's actually a camera in the truck and there, there's an alert system that beeps if they start to, it actually is looking at how fast or how slow they blink their eyes or if their eyes stay closed for a certain period of time, an alarm will go off in the truck. Wow. wow. So that that's good, good, good technology. And um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Sometimes when I feel like falling asleep at the wheel, I just ask Elizabeth to drive <laughs> and yeah. like on these long road trips, but it's like no alarm is loud enough to keep me awake. So, um, but you know, maybe with certain testing that'll work out. Yeah. So Kenya, I know you have a dog. I do have a dog and I have <laughs> children, right? One to which when he was like six months old, I accidentally locked him in my 89 Toyota Corolla on a 90 degree day. He's dropped down below, right? So I'm kind of thinking, I wish I had access to this kind of technology back then because it was a pretty panicky situation. And if I would have had something to be able to like open up the car or, I mean, thank God the window was down and I was able to call like a locksmith to come open up the door. But I think about the safety feature that could come along with some of this technology that could be good for parents, God forbid, you know, you're, you find yourself in that situation. Cause that was very scary, especially having a little baby and you're like, oh my God, it was the worst feeling ever. I just thought of it now and I had flashbacks. Oh. Yeah, there were a couple of times when my kids were growing up that I thought they were gonna die. <laughs> I was like, no, <laughs> I know. That is but if That's... we had this technology, like it would be such a, a, a godsend to be able to click a button or just be able to open up the car. It's they didn't have that in the 89 Toyota Corolla. Unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, so. that's, that's great. So great observations. We abs absolutely. So soldier on soldier on, but we have to take commercial break and we'll be right back after this. You're listening to passage to profit with Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt. Welcome back everybody to passage to profit with Richard and Elizabeth wow. Gerhardt. I'm here to introduce our very special guest this evening. Daryl Evans, who's an investor, business growth advisor, and co-founder of Yoko Local Internet Marketing. And he's also the host of the MindShift podcast. So welcome very much to the show, Daryl. Uh, and we're really pleased to have you here. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the MindShift podcast and what, what is MindShifting? Yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, MindShift podcast, uh, we started about two and a half going on three years ago. And the, the word mind shift, I'm always asked, why is it mind shift instead of mindset? And uh, really, it comes out of my life experience and my life journey of finding myself in places that maybe I didn't really want to be in. But uh, funny enough, I made decisions, behaviors, sometimes it was indecision that left me in a place that said, hmm, how did I get here? And in that particular moment or those moments, uh, these are back in my early 20s, uh, even some in my teens and even into my 30s and 40s. Every single time I found myself in one of those moments, I realized that if I wanted to go from where that place was to a new place, um, I needed to, to change. I needed to shift the way I was thinking. Uh, so obviously, a lot of people think about that on the negative side of life, and that's where I was first uh, experiencing that. But I think it's also in the world of growth as entrepreneurs, as business owners, as parents, uh, as people. And so the MindShift podcast sim simply says... Uh, we are going to explore the journey from inspiration to realization and when life knocks us down from breakdown to breakthrough. And so I enjoy sitting down with entrepreneurs, uh, people, leaders, uh, friends, people I've known for 30 plus years and really just help them, you know, pick their brain and unpack uh, the distinctions. And what we find is that we're all very similar. And so it's been a very exciting journey. Well, that's excellent. You know, we try to use this podcast to have our guests educate everybody listening. And if our presenters want to ask the guest questions, educate the presenters as well. So I, I think I'm, I've always struggled with making that paradigm shift. And it sounds like that's what you're helping people do. So that like, if you're stuck in a place and I love your, how did I get here? Like who doesn't have a few of those stories? Right? 
<laughs> we all have that same place, right? But but what can you really do to help people really make the shift that you're talking about, the mind shift? Yeah, I wish I had some clinical background study. I wish I had taken a path in psychology or I wish I could bring the, the thought process from that angle, but that's not the way my life was dealt. Uh, I made some decisions in my 20s and woke up one day uh, realizing that I was no longer going to be in my two sons' lives on a daily basis. Mm. And that decision of a relationship breakup and that decision that, that ended up leading to a relationship breakup, those decisions left me at a place where I had to decide, I had to make a distinction. How am I going to be a great father if they're going to live 1,300 miles away from me? See, I couldn't fight the fact that they were going to live there. The, the whole court thing and the judge thing and the whole custody thing and all of that thing that we know about, we hear about in the United States, uh, neither one of us thought we'd end up there, but that's where we ended up. And so the, the, the way I usually talk to folks and coach people through this is we've got to make peace with the facts. That's kind of step one in the process. It sounds simple, but a lot of times we find ourselves in a place we don't want to be. And we are, e it's easy to blame. It's easy to, uh, collaborate with and talk with the folks who want to help you. They want to agree with your negative thinking. They want to agree with your blame and pointing responsibility at the other person. The fact of the matter is, and whether it's a person, a place, a thing, or an incident, uh, we can look at what's happened in the last two and a half years. We could look at what happened in 2007, eight, and nine real estate industry. Life just happens. Uh, the issue is, is we've got to make peace with the facts. And so the facts were, they're going to live over there. I'm going to live over here now what right so the question is we we i find that in my walk and in, in uh, both my life my parents lives my family's life and in, in life of business uh, we can easily fall into this blame game and we point responsibility somewhere else and and here's what i've come to understand and learn and that whenever your life is not quite going the way you'd like whenever something happened to you or you feel like something happened to you just remember you were there when it all started. And it's just another, it's a way of turning around and saying, okay, I'm responsible at some point to being in the place or the situation or the mindset or the framework where I was in a bad place where I allowed that to happen. You know, I had a situation where um, I was looking outward to a, a circumstance, but the reality was something in my energy and pattern of behavior led me into that environment. So that that thing, if I had not led myself there, it would have never happened. And so I just help people really accept responsibility and ownership because you can't change anything if you're just blaming others or externally uh, motivated by pointing a finger. And so that's where I think it really all begins. I really love that, uh, you know, that philosophy and making peace with the facts. Sometimes it's kind of hard to figure out what the facts are, right? I mean... If, if, if you're at work and the a decision comes down from high that you don't fully appreciate or understand, you may never get to the real facts that uh, prompted that decision. And so you, you have no, nothing to base you know, your, your feelings on. So is there a way that somebody can work with that? A hundred percent. I love the way you set that framework because I, I think about uh, the early years of my working career. I worked for a company called Taco Bell, a little bitty company here in the United States. <laughs> and, and I, at that time, was an assistant. Well, first of all, I started as a fry cook. When I was 16 years old, I became an assistant manager. None of this was planned, by the way. Um, and before you know it, at 20 years old, when I'm in college, I'm a general manager of a restaurant. I'm 20 years old, running almost a million-dollar restaurant in the fast food service industry. And there were a lot of things that I enjoyed about that work and that job and the experience and the education, and it served me in so many ways the last 30 years. But I can tell you there were a number of decisions um, down the line, including one where I was running a restaurant that had literally no heat, no air conditioning. It was a building that was built in the 70s and in Vegas, as I mentioned, you know, it gets a little toasty over here in the summer. And even though it's not New England or Massachusetts or New York or Chicago in the winter, uh, you know, 35 degrees, 40 degrees with no heat is a problem. Mm -hmm. And so I've got kids in here. I'm a kid. I've got team members and this, this organization wouldn't buy us jackets. They wouldn't buy jackets in the, in the wintertime for my kid, my, my team who was at the, the drive-through window 
uh, or at the front counter when the door is coming in and out, they're freezing. And then in the summertime, we had to deal with the kitchen heat and there's no air conditioning. They had a swamp cooler in there. And after 92 degrees, it's a, it's a wrap. So what do I, I tell that story to simply say that in, in that moment, there are some facts that I don't control, like top down, someone is saying they're not going to do this. And I said, okay, well, I've got a decision to make, which is really step two in the process. The facts are the facts. They're not going to go buy us jackets. So I've got a choice to make. Do I want to go buy the jackets for them? And I, I literally did. Give me, the, give me the catalog. I will pay for them out of my pocket. Now, once I raised that concern and raised it to that level of, but the point of the, the thought is, is if I don't like the decision while I don't understand it, I can make a new decision about what I'm going to do now, whether that's been a financial challenge, whether it's two and a half years ago when my agency, when the you know, shutdown happened, we, had, we took on, uh, like any other business in the United States, uh, that agency, we took on a serious deprecation of monthly cash flow. And uh, while PPP came in the rest of the day, we were, we were really struggling when we, a lot of our clients were told they couldn't practice their business. So I think step two to that, uh, Richard, is really just understanding you can make a new decision about whatever the facts are, whether you understand those or not, because you're in control of what you do going forward, because the only thing that matters is today's now, the now moment that you're in, and what am I going to do going forward from here? So that's kind of how I uh, take a look at it. Kenya? Uh, do you have any questions or thoughts? I do. Daryl, I'm glad you brought up the shutdown because I th think I have the million dollar question is how have you taught people or business owners to make peace with the pandemic? Mm. You know, very interesting question, right? So I'm, I sat in the middle of that, right? So I sat in the middle of uh, me and my business partner, whether it was an email or a phone call uh, where companies were like, hey, uh, you haven't done anything wrong, but we're not going to be able to operate business, whether you're a dentist, whether you're a restaurant, whether all of those kinds of businesses, we have all of those kinds in our, in our world. And uh, we just need to pause our contract. Like uh, we understand we still need marketing, but we don't know where this is going to go. So two, two sides of the uh, equation, I had to think about how I was going to handle that with my team. And I had to make peace with the facts that I didn't understand what was going on either, other than that there's this illness that is, is saying it's, it's going to shut everybody down. So the, the coaching I always talk about is a, once we look at the facts, you know, how do we make peace with the facts? And I think from a leadership perspective, uh, the goal is to find a way to remain confident that there is a solution, even if we don't know what it is, right? When my company, when I'm getting a call or an email and my business partner and I are having text messages back and forth, um, and he's saying, we just lost 14,000 a month, 5,000 a month, 6,000 a month, 1,200 a month, whatever it was. And I'm watching our pay. And by the way, we didn't lay anybody off. So I, I run a business where you know, that agency is kind of like building a car to use the Ford example. I can't, I can't lay off the guy who paints the car and then expect, well, I can't lay off the person who's the engineer and expect them to paint the car, the person who paints the car to be the engineer. So that's not the way our agency works. We've got a team of experts across disciplines and we still had a lot of clients to serve. Um, but I think the first piece is finding a way to be confident. Um, getting past the level of fear and uncertainty and just building up some sort of, okay, there's a way to figure it out. I like to say that us entrepreneurs and inventors and people that really make it, um, even though we may sit in some level of fear, we just simply say, I know I'm going to figure it out. And I think that is a tough, it's a tough, um, it's a tough mindset to adopt to. So A, we were like, hey, we're going to figure this out. We're going to figure it out together, which means we got smart and started saying, oh, you can't pay us the 14,000 month full retainer. No problem. What if we reduced what we're doing so that we don't, we don't lose any momentum because we don't know if it's a 30 day thing, 60 day thing, 90 day thing. And so we ended up retaining, and this is my business partner's idea. We started retaining some of those clients um, and, and convincing them that, okay, do you think the world's going to end right now? Well, are we ever going to go back? And so we started thinking about how do we confidently speak to this? The other big uh, point to this is you can only control what you control. I believe in controlling the controllables. It is not outside of our, it's always like we want to look outside, kind of going back to that ownership earlier uh, piece. And that is what do we control? In my agency, the only thing I could control was where, uh, you know, by definition, there were non-essential and essential businesses. Hmm. The non-essential businesses are being shut down. I was actually included in that category. But because we're virtual, we could keep operating. So what do I control? Let's look down the list of who they say are essential and see if they need help. 
<laughs> right. Well, that's, yeah, so that's I launched a great a Facebook, idea. Right. Yeah. So we launched a Facebook campaign and brought in 400 new leads over the next 60 days. So I couldn't control what was going on at the grocery store or in the hospitals. And I've got three nurses in my family. My grandmother's a nurse. So I had all the empathy in the world for what was going on medically, but I can't control that. But there's this group of people that are called not uh, essential businesses, of which 85% of them wouldn't need our work. But what about the 15%? Do they still need to operate online? And so that's what we did. And so we control the controllable. So I hope that helps a little bit, uh, Kenya. I thought it was hilarious that one of the essential businesses that stayed open all through the pandemic was the liquor stores. <laughs> right. <laughs> So, exactly. <laughs> I guess they could keep it and they kept producing wine and we kept buying it. And <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, you know, that's very innovative thinking. And we try to say, we like to say the show is about innovation. So that was a very innovative approach. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so, so, so how do you work? Do you, are, are you strictly working on a podcast basis or you also mentioned that you're a growth advisor. Do you take on clients and help them grow too? Yeah. So at the agency level, we are working with small and mid-sized companies. Uh, we we tiptoed with some of the big fortune companies and uh, our business, our, our agency work is really uh, an outsourced growth marketing team that comes in to work with small and mid-sized firms where they're trying to cover the landscape of digital and as all of us probably on this call know, there's a vast landscape, you know, Google search, whether it's social media, all the things that have to happen. So we're a good fit for companies there that are really looking to outsource growth. They usually have some senior marketing leader who's really quarterbacking uh, lead, uh, marketing inside, the agent, uh, inside their world, and then they're partnering up with our team. On the business advisory side, a lot of what I love to do there is I've just experienced, you know, in the last 11 years specifically, and then in my 30-year journey, a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck once they start the business. They've got a great idea. They've got a great product. Um, and I've done a lot of things wrong. And so from that perspective, I feel like there's a way to help people see what they can't see, just like any great business coach would do, uh, whether that's uh, getting time leverage, getting uh, customer acceleration leverage, um, helping them manage and hire great staffs. It's been one of the best privileges uh, of my life to hire and employ 500 people-ish over the last 30-something years. And finding the distinction that uh, allows us to bring someone on board to our team or, or, you know, helping clients bring people on their team where the unique talent of that person aligns with the vision and purpose of that business. That's been a, a unique path for me and helping entrepreneurs see that you're not just hiring a VA or you're not just hiring an operations manager. You're need, you need to find someone who uh, sees their vision and their purpose aligning with yours, meaning what are their unique gifts? And so I've got, I've found some ways to, to, to do that. And uh, on the podcast side, it's at this point, we are, uh, I'm building a network more than anything, because I believe that there's a, an opportunity globally in the work that I'm doing uh, there to really just build a, a group of entrepreneurs that are really going to set the world on fire on the next level. I've been very fortunate. I would have never used the word legacy 10, 15 years ago, because I was in the hustle and the grind. But now it's like, hey, let's help entrepreneurs move to that next level without the same, you know, burn burn, uh, burn the candle at both ends kind of, kind of mentality. I just am over that mentality. And I don't think it's necessary with the way technology has evolved today. I think you're right. And I think that if you are burning the candle at both ends, you lose your creative time, right? Yeah. yeah. You know, I wish I could do my thirties again, but I'm glad I did my thirties because I learned. And <laughs> what I've realized is any of it goes back to that mind shift. When I turned 40, it wasn't because I turned 40, but we, I transitioned careers and uh, got out of the mortgage industry, real estate space, and, and we started this agency. And I knew I was going to be in the digital marketing space for the rest of my life because in 2003 is when I first started my journey in digital. And I just, I just don't believe in working. Hard. So as much as I worked extremely hard in my 30s, I was using technology early adopter. First email account, 2003, built my first email marketing campaign, then built my first website, 2004. I didn't build it physically, by the way. Um, but I was like, you know what? A lot of people don't know about this stuff, do they? And I'm thinking, uh, this is stuff that I think is going to continue to evolve and adapt and, and, and become more, uh, there's going to be more adoption. And so I just wanted to be on that from a life balancing standpoint. And I just made new decisions uh, kind of in that mind shift mentality of um, here's what's going to happen, I think, in tech. 
in marketing, in sales, in entrepreneurship. Here's what decision I think um, I want to make. And I just decided to reshape how I was doing things. And so I think I'm able to share some of that. So I wanted to go back uh, a little bit uh, to your uh, business growth uh, practice. How does an entrepreneur know when it's time to hire somebody? And, you know, a lot of people are solopreneurs and they are buried and they do need help, but it, you know, suddenly you're taking on responsibility of paying somebody else or at least paying, you know, a contractor or something. And then that's money out of your pocket, right? So how do people know when to make that transition? Uh, Richard, great question, tougher answer, but here's, here's what I'll, here's where I'll, where I'll uh, go with it. I think entrepreneurs know that when they look at their task list, their to-do list, or what's on their calendar, as far as things they have to output, there will be a hesitation, a reservation, and a level of procrastination that will set in when they see that item on their task or project list or their calendar. If it's a sales call, they'll feel something different about that sales call. They'll feel something different about posting on social media or running the ad campaign. Uh, Michael Gerber said it best. I, it was the first time I could really get it and, and understand it. And that is a lot of times us as entrepreneurs, we fall in one of three categories. A lot of times though, we're mostly a technician where we are great at the craft of the business. Uh, Richard, a perfect example, you're a great lawyer, right? You've been an IP lawyer. But if you wake up one day and you didn't have Elizabeth sitting next to you to do the marketing and she just decided, Richard, I'm not doing it anymore. You've got to post on LinkedIn and YouTube and handle all the marketing stuff. You might feel some sort of way. <laughs> and if you start feeling that way, I would start crying. Sign. I mean, yeah. Is... <laughs> and so I, I usually say it's when you, when, when you have something on your calendar, your task list and your head starts to hurt, and that's just a meta metaphor. That is a sign that, because here's what a lot of entrepreneurs don't ask themselves first. And this is what I talk about, which is called, we've got to identify your superstar DNA. DNA, not the biological DNA, but your definite natural ability. Mm -hmm. What is it? And there are pathways of figuring that out. A lot of people use DISC and you know Myers-Briggs. I use a program called Colby. It's Colby Index. It's a psychological-based mode of operation process and you will clearly get an idea of what will you do or won't you do in certain situations in the minute you get clear about what you will or won't do if you won't do it it means you've got to hire someone to do it because if it's important to the business you will be failing the business if you keep doing it and from a ca concept of cash flow or expenditure um, a lot of times we unfortunately burden ourselves as entrepreneurs by saying well um, I it, going back to that kind of, we love to figure things out. Sometimes we take that too far. <laughs> we take yeah. it too far and we try to figure everything out. And so you, I, I simplified to say, you will know based on how you feel, whether this is your gift or not. And the minute you recognize it's not your gift, it's your responsibility as an entrepreneur to find someone whose unique gift is that because you'll gain so much more leverage through it. And it is somewhat of a transition for some, but I learned it early um, and I just won't look back. I, I mean, there are things I think you should know before you outsource, because if you don't understand it, it's hard to manage it. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair? Like, so I really am a big believer in people knowing, entrepreneurs knowing a little bit about the topic so that if they outsource it, they don't get burned. See, and that's what I hear about in the last 11 years, people outsourcing their marketing and they come back and say, oh, I paid all these thousands of dollars and we didn't get any results. Yeah. And they didn't understand any of what they were doing. They just wanted to write the check and not have to deal with it. And that's just not, that's not good stewardship of, of our business capital. Right. And, and really playing to your strengths and not, and having somebody else do things your week at is why I have a cleaning lady. hundred <laughs> <laughs> percent. But a hundred percent. I want to like pick your brain a little more and go forward because obviously you saw internet marketing before a lot of other people saw it and got into it early. So now we have this metaverse coming upon us, <laughs> being thrust on us. So obviously that's going to be a marketing gem for the people that know how to use it that way. Right. So are you 
preparing for that? Are you looking at what that is and figuring out where marketing is going to fit? Or what are you doing about that? I am looking at it at a level of, it might be 1% of my attention. I'm following a little bit of the pathway, but here's what I've learned. And, and this is what I found over the last 20 something years. I learned this in college, actually. It's called the diffusion of innovation bell curve. And that is that whenever things come out, technologies come out, uh, new things like we're going to talk about here in a little while on the show, there's going to be a small percentage of people that will be the innovator class, right? That's perfect for this show. There's going to be a small majority of people, three, four, five percent of people that will be innovators in that space. There's another group of people called early adopters, about 12 or 13 percent, 14 percent of the market. You can Google this chart, by the way. I'm making up the numbers because I don't have it in front of me. But as a reference point, I'm always more of that early adopter kind of person where I'm in that 13% category. So I won't be that first person to jump in to that world. The next group of people is the early majority. When things, when a product or service reaches mass market adoption, you're going to have this early majority of people want to get in. Um, you know, so for, if we look at the iPhone, for example, in 2007, the people who bought it, the minute it came out, they were in the, you know, early, uh, they were the innovator class. Uh, even before early adopters, I didn't get an iPhone until 2014. So that's seven years later. And then there's going to be the late majority of folks, which is when the bell curve starts to turn over. And then you've got a category called laggards at the very end, which means you've got to literally turn the thing off before they stop using it. Right. And I think about analog cable to digital cable boxes, really the TV still looked the same, but the box was being changed out. This is maybe a decade and, you know, about 12, 14 years ago. So I am, not, I'm an early adopter, but I'm not going to be the innovator to jump in. So while I've heard about it, I'm not thinking about it because there's still a huge early and, and late majority of people who still don't have good websites, who still aren't running good ad campaigns. And last I checked, Google and Facebook are both ad platforms. And until they prove to me that we can run ads there, look, we can't even run ads in Facebook groups yet. So until they figure that out, you know what I'm saying? So there's a limited amount yeah. of inventory in all these spaces. So these two platforms, until they open a pathway of advertising, which is how we run ROI largely, it isn't mm -hmm. that we don't do organic stuff. But if I can't put a dollar in and produce for my client two, three, four, five back, I, it doesn't, it, it can't warrant my attention. And that's just the way I, I've seen it because I believe as business owners, we have to be good stewards of our investments and our dollars, which means there's got to be some path to ROI. And it's just something that I don't see yet, but it's interesting to talk about. Well, thanks a lot, Daryl. That's wonderful advice. We have to move on to a commercial break, but thanks for joining us. We loved your insights and your business advice. And thanks I feel personally me. like I've learned quite a bit which is the whole point of That's the show. Good. <laughs> Glad so to hear it. We'll be back after this, everybody. <laughs> Richard and Elizabeth Gerhardt with Passions Profit and our special guest this evening, Daryl Evans. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's Passage to Profit. And coming up next, we have Kenya Gibson, who's going to be talking about Power Move. Kenya, nice to see you. Who is our Power Move about tonight? Nice to see you too. And we're going to talk about Kanye West on Power Move today and his new invention, the STEM player. So he's releasing Donda 2 and he does not want to work with Apple and doesn't want to work with Spotify on the release. So he's decided to create his own musical platform. The STEM player is a pocket size music device. You can manipulate the songs, isolate elements, speed the song up, slow it down. And it's really changing the way music is distributed and consumed. And he generated $2.2 million in sales in just 24 hours, just released the other day. So in addition to that revenue, he's going to be able to keep all the streaming rights and he's not going to have to really leverage any of these other Apples or Spotify's of the world. So I thought that was a superpower move. And considering that Apple offered him $100 million for this album release that's coming up and he was able to find a way to release content and own the rights, I thought that was brilliant wow wow that is super impressive so this is is it like an mp3 player what what kind of files does it use or it, does it, it have its own file system or it has i'm sure it has its own file system it's a little gadget it's round it lights up and basically all the music that's going to be released on the platform will be downloadable to this device so 
any song, you're going to be able to kind of pick apart the beat, the sound effects. So it's it's more than just, you know, you listening to music. If you're a creative and you're a DJ or you create music or beats, you're going to be able to play around with this thing and, you know, sample. And so I thought that was so cool that this little pocket handheld thing is like the Walkman of the future. Right. Right. I was going to say iPod on steroids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. That's great. So thank you for sharing that. And now it's time for Elizabeth Gearhart and her uh, What's Up with Fireside. Yes. So I have a startup called Fireside Directory, uh, another tool for the digital marketing space. It is a video directory of business owners. And I've kind of had to pivot a few times. I've talked about it on every show since I started it, but Basically, I interview business owners about their businesses and put them on a directory, which I'm still working on the IT part, which to Daryl's point, I don't, I've learned a lot about websites and I've learned a lot about IT and some about programming, but that is really where I can't do it myself as an entrepreneur. I, I, I have to have help. So I've managed to squeeze some money out. I think, um, to try to find the right person to help me with all of the tech piece of this, but it really is a tech thing. And I really do want it to be a standalone directory, a true directory. And I want to distinguish it from other directories that exist now, like Google, like I want it to be like a Google with videos kind of if small businesses, but not have all the other stuff that comes up when you're searching for something. I want to have as much as I can, and I don't know if the programming is there yet, I want to have a very clean search engine so that if you type in patent attorney, you only get patent attorneys. You don't well, get- Well, hopefully you're only going to get me. But, <laughs> it, it, it... <laughs> but you, you know, you don't get, oh, here's a divorce attorney or here's a sponsored link to a real estate attorney or whatever. No, yeah, you're isn't that, gonna... That's funny because how many times do you type in like dining room table and then like all sorts of tables come up and you know, you know, why did you, why did, why are people trying to sell me stuff that I don't want? Right. So. so anyway, so that's kind of the goal for this is to have it be a super clean search engine, which I'm finding is is kind of tough. And some of the things I wanted to do with the project, the technology isn't there yet, but I'm hoping like in five years it will be. So so there's a lot to happen still with this. So yeah, go go see at. Kanye West and he'll he'll invent the technology for you, I guess. Anyway, <laughs> I don't think that's happening anytime soon. <laughs> Let's get on to our presenters. Okay, so yes, yeah, so. I get to introduce our presenters. So our first presenter is Ron Richard, medical device inventor, author, certified medical consultant. I love his last name. <laughs> yes, <you laughs> would. And his website is inventingstartstoday.com. And he has a book that goes along with it. So welcome, Ron. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Yeah, thanks for having me on the show. I, uh, I appreciate it. And I really learned a lot also from your guest, Daryl. You've got a parallel universe somewhat, Daryl, in terms of uh, some of the things you talked about in terms of job creation and entrepreneurship. But my business, uh, we do consulting for primarily people that have invented medical products. And the challenge I have is a lot of my clients are doctors or they're clinicians, and they haven't gone to school about business. And so one of the things you brought up was as an entrepreneur, particularly if you're a clinician or a doctor, is when do you bring in help? because they're not used to uh, you know, bringing other people in to talk about, well, I've got this great idea, I wanna commercialize it, uh, but I don't know anything about mechanical engineering or how to build software platforms or how do I get through the FDA? You know, That's another big thing. So my book, Someday is Today, is this framework that I actually wrote after I did a lecture at Stanford for physicians who wanna have a income stream outside of their medical practice. So they've got great ideas. They see firsthand, I've got patients that are using this current technology, but I have a better idea. I want to get my idea on the market and how do I do that? And that's what my book is really all about. It's job creation and also commercializing innovation. But uh, again, going back to the premise of it, I'm a clinician. I started working in a hospital and it was just fortunate for me. I was a cook like you. Uh, I worked in a, I was a fry cook, got a job in a hospital, was working there. And one day I was in the cafeteria and a friend of mine stopped by and he said, hey, we've got an opening up in the respiratory therapy department. Would you be interested? And I'm like, what's respiratory therapy? <laughs> so just by luck, I said, sure, let's go up there. And I interviewed and I got a job as a therapist. 
And that's when I made my first invention was a communication board to help people that are on ventilators and they can't speak. They lose their ability to talk because they have a tube down their throat and so on. So that was my, my first invention and exposure to becoming an entrepreneur and kind of getting on into my career uh, out, outside the hospital. So did you have any problems with the hospital wanting to own your inventions? Uh, back then, no. But, you know, a lot of doctors I work with, Elizabeth, that is a, that's the first thing I ask them is you're inventing this uh, basically while you're working in an institution. And you'll probably be approached by the hospital and they'll ask for a licensing fee. And that's pretty common anymore. Most of the doctors I work with work at John Hopkins. They work at Stanford or Mayo or bigger teaching institutions. Mm -hmm. And the typical fees are anywhere between 2 and 4%. That's interesting. Our daughter is a nurse. And she's, of course, constantly, well, she, you know, she's related to him and us. <laughs> I'm constantly well, thinking so. of, <laughs> yeah, of new ways to do things. Like the nurses are front lines a lot of times, right? So she's come up with a few great ideas, but there's always the question like who's going to own the intellectual property. And so that's interesting that you figured that piece out with the doctors. That's great. Yeah. And, and I, you know, what I tell physicians, clinicians, nurses, whoever come to me, that's really the first step to kind of clear the, the runway for you to commercialize something. You don't want to commercialize something or get millions of dollars invested in it. And then the hospital comes back and says, Oh, Hey, by the way, you owe us uh, 2% of everything you just sold. Right. Right. So if she invented like a, let's just say a new valve for something, um, would she be, she would be able to manufacture and sell it. Would you, would you help her get it approved by the FDA and would you help insurance, get it so insurance companies would pay for it? Do you go that far? Yeah, we do everything. We work with reimbursement. Uh, Richard, we work with Mints. That's my IP people mm -hmm. that do all of our medical patents. Um, we work with uh, engineering people that can help, you know, like for instance, this person do a prototype. So that's, those are all the elements that we can put together under one umbrella to, to assist someone get a product to market. Yeah, that's uh, uh, out, outstanding. And uh, I think for physicians, well, we, we, we represent a number of physicians as well. And um, to have sort of a one-stop turnkey operation for them is absolutely critical because some of them are interested in, in going on the commercial path, but a lot of them, like especially, uh, you know, cardiologists, neurosurgeons, they already have an extremely busy life, right? Mm -hmm. And they need a place to just hand off the technology and have somebody else uh, run with it. And so uh, if you can provide that service for them, then, you know, they're, it, it just works out for, for everybody. And they also have very limited time. And so they, they, you know, getting their attention on certain issues sometimes can be a real challenge. So it's definitely, uh, but on the other hand, as you mentioned, they're, they're working with patients, they're doing their surgeries or other things. They know what's needed uh, and they know what is, is, is uh, going to make uh, their patients more comfortable or improve the quality of medicine because they're, they're doing it. Right, but the other piece of this, is, so I do marketing, is the marketing for this is not to the consumer. It's completely different than consumer-based marketing, right? Because you are actually marketing to the hospitals or the, I don't know, who, who are your clients for this? Uh, we market pretty much specifically to yeah, hospitals, but mostly clinicians. We have databases, obviously, and mailing lists uh, that we can send out information to. But going back to, there's something Daryl said earlier. It's kind of interesting. I'm working with a client now. They put $6 million into a new high flow therapy device that's used to treat COVID. And uh, unbeknownst to us, we had to pivot pretty quickly because hospitals weren't allowing visitors, which means sales reps to come in and do actual demos. So we had to create a whole arsenal of digital assets that we could show to doctors and clinicians through Zoom or through a virtual kind of a portal to kind of educate them or get them interested in a product that they've never seen before. So 
it was really interesting. It stalled us out for about a year. Uh, in terms, now things are different. People are actually seeing sales reps again, and our sales are, are starting to pick up. But um, to answer your question, basically, yeah, be uh, word of mouth, networking, and then also just working at trade shows. Uh, oh, trade shows. Yeah. Are they doing trade shows again now? Uh, this year, yeah, we're attending. We've got four trade shows that we're going to be at. Um, but you're right. For the past two years, they've been kind of virtual internet based uh, experiences, which really haven't worked out very well. So, uh, Kenya, do you have any questions or thoughts? I do. I think it's like a dual question for both you and Ron. So say, you know, you're a doctor and you're a creator and you're working at these corporations. It's pretty hard to create something sometimes when you're under the auspice of a corporation. What are some ways that creators or innovators can protect themselves from the onset? So say you have an idea, you're working for a hospital corporation, like what, what should you put in place immediately to make sure that you have some protection there so that when you do get to the phase of going public, you can keep, you know, the rights to everything and it not be a conflict of interest. Um, well, I'm, I'm happy to address that, uh, uh, Ron, Ron, if you want, or you can address it, I'm sure. No, I'm, I'm, the, the other Richard, I'll let him talk. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks. So, uh, well, the first step is to look at your employment agreement and uh, see what the contract is between you and uh, the hospital. Um, usually they're written in fairly draconian terms that favor uh, the hospital. Uh, and so there are sometimes there's clauses in the agreement that uh, are uh, you know, not really enforceable, um, but you have to keep in mind that this is your employer, right? And so you don't want to be put in a position of doing something that is going to make your un employer uh, unhappy. Uh, and so that what you should do just what Ron uh, suggested, and you should see if there's a way that you can submit your idea to the hospital administration, and uh, or you need to approach the supervisor and make sure that you, you know, this is, uh, everything's all okay with that. And different hospitals have different, you know, policies and they have different degrees of uh, freedom for these kinds of uh, side projects. But most of the time, if you're, if, if you're a doctor, they want to keep you. And as long as it doesn't interfere with your work at the hospital, they're pretty open to those things. Um, there's also laws in most states that limit the, um, the ability of uh, somebody to con contract away their rights. So, uh, so really getting all of that cleared away, get the open runway is really the, the best first step. So, so Daryl? The, the only thing I'd add to that, it's a win-win if you go to the hospital administration as a doctor and say, you know, I've got this, I think, better mousetrap or better idea to improve healthcare and improve outcomes, reduce healthcare costs. And I'd like to continue to work on this and let's come to an agreement that I can work on it. And you're still gonna get a percentage of whatever we sell after we commercialize it. The hospital then gets the notoriety of, well, we, we help develop and invent this. And we help this doctor who in turn now has got this company and you know, they've hired 50 people or whatever to manufacture this great new innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I was going to I was going to ask the question and you just beat me to the answer, which is, is there opportunities for joint venturing in this kind of example where uh, to uh, Richard's point earlier, you, you, this is your employer, you're on their time. Uh, they obviously have a lot more resources than an individual, uh, you know, with this process. So it would seem to be that a, whether it's a licensing or some sort of joint venture, even to speed along the process um, uh, as a co-collaboration in it. So just to give you an example of that, there is one hospital in New York State that actually has uh, a, an accelerator, a, an accelerator being a place where people with uh, ideas can go to get investment and support, and they take projects that can be developed for use in the hospital. So they, they focus on medical devices. Uh, you know, because they're easier to get uh, F the path to FDA approval is, is usually shorter, 
but they specific ha specifically have a, a, a group that funds those projects and then um, and then they can use can sort of do a, a, a test in the hospital. And um, so it's 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 interesting concept. I haven't heard of too many hospitals doing that. But, uh, yeah, yeah and, and, well, you know, Richard, too, the, the key or one of the fundamental things to help a, what I call plan. If you see a if you see a need, plant the seed and the seed is, well, I see a need as a doctor, so I'll plant the seed. What do seeds need to grow? They need fertilizer. They need water. They need care. And the same thing with an idea that you have as a concept or an invention, particularly in the medical industry, you need money. Right. And right. So if you get into an accelerator, you can get into angel funding or whatever. You, you have to have funding to be successful in launching your product. Right. So can we talk about the IP just for a second? So the doctor who invents, the inventors are the only ones that get their names on the patent application itself and on the patent but they can assign it to the hospitals. So do the hospitals ask them to assign their intellectual property or you said they just take a percentage of the, and the license deal, right? I've seen it go both ways. Um, a lot of times, you know, Richard would represent a doctor and he may counsel him or give him advice, don't assign it, you know, ne negotiate whatever, just keep your name on all of the IP. But if you can't get to that place with the attorneys at the hospital, you know, you just got to agree, like uh, Daryl said, there's certain things you can control and certain things you can't control. You got to pivot and then go, the better thing for me to do is just look at the future and let's move past this. Absolutely. Right. So you may have to assign it even if you don't want to. Right. But if you look at all these big companies, like if you look at this patent that we just talked about with Ford, you know, Ford Motor Company didn't invent it. Somebody else did and they had to assign it to Ford. Right. And, and so, so working, yeah, usually most employees are required. Now, there are some exceptions to that. And so if the, your invention is unrelated to the business of the company or and you use company materials uh, or not company materials, you use your, your own materials, um, then typically uh, there are state laws that would protect your ownership, and especially if you work on it on your own time, right? So even if there's a clause in your contract that, to, you know, you should always have the situation, you know, reviewed by an attorney. But for example, California has fair, very strict laws about um, uh, people get to own their own inventions if it's not related to the business of the company, if they do it on their own time and they don't use uh, company materials. But really, to, it, to if you invent something when you're working at a hospital and you're in the medical field to really realize money from your invention, you really do need to work with someone like Ron who knows how to how to make these deals work, right? Right. He obviously has a lot of experience in this field and it's a complicated field. The manufacturing is complicated. Uh, the approval process is complicated and the market is complicated. Right. So it's it's important that you get somebody with a high level of expertise if you're going to go that route. Right. And I didn't I didn't realize that there were medical consultants like you, Ron, but it makes a lot of sense. And uh, I think doctors, I think you're doing a great service because because you have you're helping all these doctors. We're getting all these innovative products on the market that are making life in the hospital as comfortable i'll never say <laughs> being in hospital bed is comfortable, no, i was but... in a hospital for <laughs> yeah. a cat bite i don't yeah. even know if i told the story but i had we had a evil cat uh that we adopted and it just chomped onto my hand and pierced my skin all the way through i was in the hospital for three weeks uh, and I can tell you that that was one of the most miserable experiences ever. I'm never going back to the hospital, no matter what. But well, yes, you people, are they, got, cat, they had people coming in at four fever. in the morning. Right. What's that? Did you get cat scratch fever? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. So uh, anyway, yeah. anyway, it was they were coming it, it in. Was, at, four in the morning taking my blood and it was like I never got any sleep so anyway yes and I had to go visit him which was no picnic either so anyway <laughs> I can't believe well, you just said that I really can't I love sitting on those hard plastic <laughs> hospital chairs getting shoved and, out of the way and by the food is so good anyway we have to move on now so 
we have to take a break. So Ron, great talking with you and uh, you. enjoyed uh, hearing about your business. Which... Inventingstartstoday.com. Yeah, and uh, we'll be back right after this. Well, welcome back, listeners. This is Richard and Elizabeth Gearhart with Passage to Profit. Of course. And if you've missed any of our shows so far, we've had some really valuable information for entrepreneurs. Where can people find it? If all they the didn't major catch podcasting the whole... sites, Passage to Profit Show on all the major podcasting sites. And when does the podcast come out? So this airs on iHeartRadio and then the podcast comes out the next day. Okay. So it airs Sunday evenings at 11 and the podcast comes out the next day. So if you want to listen to it again, over and over and over again, you can. You, well, they may want can... to fast forward to get to some really interesting tidbit of information like everybody's websites which i will say at the very end so okay. anyway without further ado i would i am dying to introduce our next presenter because i think what she has is really cool and it's something every dog owner needs and so welcome beth harriman with do loop well, thank you so much for having me and um, everybody else as I've been listening is all this very high level stuff and now we're just going to guess, I guess, get down to poop. Um, <laughs> so, we're going to get to the bottom to of the, things, to right? The, to, exactly. To the, to the real, to the real stuff. Um, so anyway, yeah, I, out of necessity, div um, invented a um, leash ex accessory. It holds on, goes on to your um, leash handle called a do loop and basically for anybody who's out walking a dog so Richard you will no longer have an excuse not to have a dog for this issue <laughs> um, you once you scoop the poop you just um, you don't actually even need to tie off the bag but you can just thwack it right onto a do loop with one hand um, ah. it's the the functionality had been in, had been considered but the ease of use for the do loop is is um, is actually the big innovation. Um, wow. We had, yeah, I had um, signed up to foster a couple basset hounds at the suggestion of my children and um, who would not be walking the dogs. And the two dogs that we got were fabulous, but they would be running in different directions. And um, it was just, as they say in the show, and, um, and I <laughs> needed an extra hand and this was my Hail Mary for sanity. So anyway and i'm making them here in maine which i'm very proud we're talking about hearing about sort of intentionality and um and what you can control and um anyway i'm making them in maine and using recycled plastic and paying a fair wage for assembly and trying to be as eco-friendly as possible and um so yeah it's a simple little thing but as i'm listening to everybody talk um it's it's funny how complicated it gets you know, really right. quickly when you're in business and figuring out which to go and when you need to hire somebody. And I've really had that feeling quite <laughs> with quite a bit of the things that Daryl was talking about when you're looking at something and think, thinking like, do I want to do that? And it's like, no, um, <laughs> you know, and um, anyway, so it's well, been, it's been well, a fun I, adventure. I, are you a solopreneur then? Are you uh, pretty much on your, on your own uh, in this project so far, or do you have, um, do you have help from other sources, I guess, is my question. Yes, well, I'm a solopreneur, but I have um, have outsourced and hired some people to help me with different things like um, like my LinkedIn profile and things like this. And of course, I had to hire um, an industrial designer to help me get my little handmade do loops into a form that could be um, produced. Mm -hmm. And, um, and he was great. And I'm not a graphic designer, which is shocking. And so I've needed to hire, you know, graphic designers to help and another big surprise IT, not my thing. Um, so, you know, I've had to hire people to help me with IT and, um, yeah, basically just a whole bunch of, you know, a bunch of those tasks that need to be done. Yeah. I mean, I always admire solopreneurs because, you, you really do have to be a, a, a jack of all trades to at least uh, some degree. And you, you must have a good people sense too, because it sounds like you're satisfied with the people that you hired. Uh, and so that's, you know, very important is, you know, making the right choices there. Right. And I, I want to say you left something off when you were talking about your description. It comes in seven modern colors to coordinate with any outfit so no excuses and um but i wondered where are you selling these right now 
Um, I'm selling them on my website, but I have a store locator. My website's just been updated. I've got a store locator because I'm selling in um, several hundred um, independent stores around the country and actually um, overseas too. And I would love people to be able to go on there and find a store near them and shop locally. So that's really goals. But right now I sell them there. I um, also sell them on the Gromit. Um, Orvis carries them. So um, I've always said nobody's um, experience or outfit was elevated by holding a bag of poop. So I had some, <laughs> I had some um, poop bags made sort of for marketing. When I first started out in Autumn, it says this is not a Louis Vuitton bag. So I <laughs> don't think you're looking good. <laughs> I love the story because yeah, it's, it's so, so awesome. Well, uh, uh, Daryl, do you have any questions or I, I, two questions? Yes. Um, first of all, congratulations. Um, I question, how did you get distribution in that many locations at this early stage? That's, that's amazing. Oh, thank you. Um, when you don't know anything, um, sometimes you do stuff that you probably shouldn't do. So I um, bought a, um, and it was back by like the, the restrooms, it was like a half a mile from the new product section, um, a booth at Super Zoo at the last minute in um, before everything shut down. And I, I don't know, sort of Googled what trade show booths look like and invited my brother and a couple friends and we didn't know anything, but we anyway had a booth and it was super fun and um, made a lot of connections that way. Um, so trade shows have actually probably been the best because what's what's odd about my product is it doesn't have a noun attached to it. So like if I say bowl or leash or lamp or something like you, it can be any lots of different types, but you know basically what it is and what the functionality is. My thing um, for people who are listening, it's like five inches by two and a half inches and it's and it's sort of a dog head shaped loop with a channel and then a little ring at the top to that you can put um, a carabiner or ball chain and attach it to your leash um, handle or you can put on a toggle on your jacket or a backpack whatever and um, you can call it like a dog poop bag holder but that's also usually things something that holds bags um, poop bags and this is bags of poop which is a small but significant difference mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what i mean so it's kind of so it's been this really interesting when i realized um that i thought oh my gosh like how do you it's it's a totally different classification of product right so when you're been... when you've got something truly innovative like that it's hard to describe it doesn't fit in any of the categories that exist because it's an innovation <laughs> that's exactly that's exactly it elizabeth that's exactly it like when they'll say like what what thing in the pet does it go into and it's like it's not a leash or a collar it's not a poop bag it's not you know it's it's so it's it's just kind of in this weird space right now i do think because it's so easy to use frankly that um it will be the next um sort of thing that everybody just ends up having you know it it'll just people will just assume because honestly, once you use it and go for your walks, when you, if you change your leash, like my little brother changes leashes, like, I'm like, ah, like, what am I doing holding this? You know, and this was the kid um, who, when I asked him first, he was just like, I live in California, you know, we have trash cans everywhere, I wouldn't use it. And, and he, he's like my best salesperson. Um, and the same thing with a store owner in New York City. At first, she was not interested in carrying them. And I just saw her at this trade show in New York City. And she said, she said, she stopped by the booth. She said, I get it now. I moved out to Long Island. She's like, oh my God. So she, she bought a bunch for her store. Um, so I, I think it'll be the next thing. Um, yeah. But when we're talking about IP, you know, and, um, and stuff like this, uh, you know, I'm being knocked off. Oh. And so I, I would like, mm. I would, but so I would like advice because Mm -hmm. I know that my invention is so simple. It's a commodity. Right. It's yep. really a commodity piece. And so that's was part of the intentionality behind keeping Pick It Made in Maine. It's, you know, still sells for under $10, but, you know, I'm keeping it made in the U.S. and being eco-friendly and, and, you know, trying, paying people so that 
you know, I don't know. Hopefully there are ways to some... stop knockoffs and there are, are things that the actually government helps you do with stuff coming from other countries on boats and stuff. Um, Richard right. knows so, a lot more. Yeah, you can register. Yeah, have you registered your product yet at customs? My thing, the I wish I'd had you as my lawyer for IP the first first time. <laughs> my first rodeos are rough. Um, lots of lots of chapped chapped bums. Um, I think he got a design patent, not a utility patent, because of right. some 1917 right. jam scoop holder thing. And right. so this is very obscure and it didn't get for the channel, which is actually the game changer. I think the good news is, is I've got a new one coming out, um, but I'm lawyering it up much harder and I yeah. think mm -hmm. smarter. Right. Um, and I think it will be completely a game changer because I don't well, know why great. everybody just wouldn't have one. So, you know, they're also, you know, if, if they're, you're getting uh, knocked off on um, Amazon, Amazon has a patent uh, and trademark dispute resolution system where you can submit your, your patent to, uh, you, can, it, you can make your case to a, an attorney that Amazon hires and it's like $10,000 for each side. So you can, you can stop knockoffs uh, if, and if you win, they'll they'll take it they'll take it down, and so you, you don't have to go to court in order to stop somebody. So if you're getting knocked off on Amazon, you should investigate that that possibility, especially if they're copying your design. Right, even if you're not on Amazon, if you're not selling on Amazon, but somebody else is selling it on Amazon, I think you can still enforce your intellectual property rights with them. Right, well, and it's fairly new; it's about a couple of years old, so. Uh, you, you know, so that's something to consider too, you know, rather than trying to play whack-a-mole with all of these um, different importers, if you can get them off Amazon, that's usually a pretty good place to, uh, you know, that's a good first strike, right? Because right. that's probably where you're getting some sales. But I really do. I'm going to buy this for my son. He got in a fight with somebody at the dog park because he didn't pick up the poop quickly enough. <laughs> This guy, yeah, this, this guy came this up, has, you're going to pick has, that up. This has a social purpose. <laughs> this has a invention. social purpose. It, it will keep, Stop keep the our dog. Parks. <laughs> yeah, you just got to get it in the dog parks, right? Like, I can imagine the woman in New York, like there's a lot of dog parks in New York, but Kenya, we haven't heard from you yet on this. Well, you kind of beat me to it, Beth. That was my question. I was going to ask you if you were experiencing any knockoffs or people trying to steal and clearly... That's what's happening. Yeah. Well, and it's happened with China and, you know, they can make cheap stuff all day long and you know what I mean? And, and power it out. So I'm, like I said, I'm not, I'm kind of in this, in the, in the spirit of control, those things that you can, <laughs> I'm right. trying to like, let it go um, right. and not worry about it. Um, but I do think I'm, I'm reading now um, that um, the compostable and the biodegradable poop bags and stuff like this are they're like the market is expected to really grow hugely on that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I was joking with a friend. I said, I think dog poop is going to be going to um, become basically the next cow fart um, or, <laughs> or plastic straw, you know, where all of a sudden everybody's just like, oh, my gosh, like these poor sea creatures right. with plastic straws. And so everybody's mm -hmm. like, I've you know, paper straws. And then we found out like, like a gassy cow is, you know, actually doing real damage, you know, and to the ozone and stuff. And we need electric cows. Well, no, we I think actually, that's what we should Ken, do is Kenya and I, electric cows. Kenya and I actually talked about that on a previous show. They emit greenhouse gases from both ends and a lot of they, them. A lot, of, exactly. It's a big deal. And, and all of a sudden, again, I, I don't know. I don't know what the karma was that brought me to dog poop, um, but here we are. <laughs> just going to work with you, what you we know, got. We're getting into a whole new world of emissions now. <laughs> I when know. we're talking about I know cow, just... cows and dogs, and it's just. <laughs> but it's, if I, it's if funny. I uh, can I can oh. I add a comment? And, and it's interesting because I've heard you say a couple of things too that I think also around this idea of people knocking off and getting into the market. But you've also said some things that are distinctive, right? That you've got a purpose, you, there's a purposeful passion behind why you've created it. You've used the word eco-friendly. You've used on your website, non-toxic, BPA-free. There's a community of people in the world today 
that if you just add that to dog lover and then that topic, you will build a community around this concept and it doesn't matter who knocks it off because they will be a fan of your principle. And that's what I, a lot of times we don't think about that when Mm -hmm. we're doing marketing, we don't think about, uh, they use the fancy phrase niching down. But the fact of the matter is the riches are in fact in the niches if you can find it. And you are also in front of an eco-friendly movement of, so you, you have, Yes, someone knocking it off, not saying don't do the legal thing to do that right, but um, you have this really rich opportunity, I think, to build community around not just folks who love dogs, but listen, I walk a little 12 pounder, 14 pounder, and to pick up the poop and and deal with her anxiousness and and all that and and have to carry the bag and I, there's no trash can on my track on my track either. Um, I'm gonna pick one up myself and and see how it plays out. So um, interesting thoughts though. Congratulations. Well, yeah, no, I, 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 I love the, uh, I love the concept and the principle. And I think riches you know, are in the niches, riches are in the niches, love but that. <laughs> I, I, you know, you, you, you can get legal protection and that's part of it, but having a barrier to entry like that, uh, for your kind of product is, I think that's a, just a supreme idea. So very, very good idea. And it's made in Maine, right? So, yeah. It's, it's made in Maine and, and um, the, the, the poo wave is coming because now all of a sudden in the media, I'm seeing all of this stuff about, um, about uh, how toxic dog poop is. And of course people send me stuff since I'm the dog poop lady, which is awesome. Um, you know, about it getting into watersheds and, and just like parovirus and, and wildlife. And it's like, actually really bad in the environment and i feel like it's a new cow fart like it's something we all just you don't even think about it and then all of a sudden when you start getting information about it you're like ooh. so i'm hoping so, that making well, them eco-friendly will be good ever <laughs> think your life would go in the direction say. of being the dog poop lady when you were five years old <laughs> were you thinking to yourself i want to be the dog poop this expert was, this has been my goal <laughs> exactly, and exactly. It, i'm living the dream i'm just living the dream some girls like want to be princesses i'm just like no 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 you, give me you dog know, you poop. Get, you've, you've gotta, made peace with the facts yeah you need, to, you need to get on the drew barrymore show or something drew barrymore has a million animals i think and loves animals yeah so if you have a connection, set me up. Right. Well, I do have She's someone. Great. I do have someone I want to introduce you to who helps people with consumer products like this get more sales. So, um, and she's a consumer products queen. She's called the Inventress. She has inventions herself. So okay. Oh, so sure. and how can people find you? Yes. Oh, they they can find me at thedooloop.com, and that's the and then d o o l o o p dot com and you'll know you've got it right because if you turn do loop in lowercase upside down it still says do loop so come see me there that's pretty cool i'm gonna try that yes it does (laughs) all right we'll be right back after this welcome back listeners to passage to profit with richard and elizabeth gearhart and our special guest today daryl evans It was a truly amazing show, wasn't it? I learned so much about different types of emissions. It was just (laughs) never, I never thought I would be having a discussion like this. No, we kind of worked our way down. We went from mindset to medical devices down to poop. Well, I did, I used the word bedpans. Yes, you did. So, So, so we kind of worked our way down the body, right? Started the head, <laughs> went, went all over with medical devices, and then down for the poop. So anyway, that was profound. I so oh, thank anyway, you. So. <laughs> <laughs> that was profound. Anyway, who did we have? Well, we had Daryl Evans, and he has the Mind Shift podcast, which is just like it sounds. And so you can find it at the mindshiftpodcast dot com. Uh, Daryl gave us just incredible advice and like real world advice like pretty much be pragmatic deal with what you have don't whine about what you don't what you've lost or whatever you think you've done wrong right i mean i think he has a lot of great concepts and i'm sure our our listeners would enjoy his podcast as well so oh i'm gonna listen to it yeah i think it's a great one um and then we had kenya gibson with her power move segment and she is our media maven from iheart so if you do want to get on the radio 
besides this podcast or do any ads on the radio or whatever, Kenya is the right person. It's Kenya Gibson with a P at iHeartMedia.com. It is. And then. Thank you, Kenya. Yes. <laughs> then we had Ron Richard, who his website is inventingstartstoday.com. He's also got this awesome book with an incredible title, Someday is Today. Right. And so you can find that on Amazon on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. It's Ron Richard. And if you have an idea for a medical device, he can help you from, all the way through. From A to Z. From Well, that's Lisa's, but um, right. He can help you. Well, from soup to nuts. Okay. From soup to nuts. From so, beginning to end. From <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> from start to finish. <laughs> from alpha to omega. <laughs> so anyway, um, anyway, but seriously, if you, and he can help you navigate all the technical hurdles and everything through that and all the yeah. bureaucratic stuff. So very, very valuable business. And then for all you dog owners out there, Beth Harriman has invented the do loop, which you can find at the D O O L O O P.com do D O O loop L O O P.com. And it's basically a bag holder. And it's, it's a very innovative product. It's hard to describe but you get onto the dog leash and then you can put poop in it so and it only takes a second so and it comes in seven different colors so it's fashion safe <laughs> it's fashion <laughs> fashion forward so listen to the podcast if you haven't if you missed any of this because we just really had some great content today i thought so i was just totally blown away by our guests and i loved every minute of it uh but before we go um, Daryl, do you have any thoughts for our, our listeners? Yeah, I mean, thank you for uh, taking some time out of your day. I'm always uh, honored to have an opportunity to share um, some time and space with great thinkers. And this has been uh, just another one of those great experiences. So thanks for hosting this platform. Uh, congratulations to both Beth and Ron uh, for their inventions and the work that they're doing in the world. And uh, Kenyon for your media maven is uh and and actually i didn't know about kanye's product i just heard about that um uh i mean i heard he was doing something but i really didn't know much about it so that's very interesting and i think that uh as we all create our own pathways in life uh, this was a great opportunity to share a discussion so thanks for having me wonderful kenya no, I think this was a great conversation and all the elements to just getting your idea together and getting it out there, right? So we talked about starting with the mind shift with Daryl, right? Because it's all about like where your mindset is and like where you launch from. And then Ron is able to help us kind of put and formulate a plan to getting our vision and our invention out there. And then you do the do like Beth, right? <laughs> like she did getting her product out there because today, or I was going to say, because someday is today according to what Ron says. So today is the day to do that and get your idea out there and get your dream going. Way to pull it all together, Kenya. Kenya's amazing. She, isn't always. she? Yeah. yeah. So in any case, we have to sign off now. Thank you for listening. We love, uh, we love our audience and keep those cards and letters coming <laughs> in. Uh, our guests may find that it's difficult to go to the uh, mall after this program. You may be mauled and asked for autographs and pictures and <laughs> selfies and stuff like that so but in any case um it happens to us all the time it right. happens to us all the time not really <laughs> not really no but in any case uh i'd like to take the opportunity to thank our producer no noah fleischman our production assistant uh, uh, uh alicia morrissey our video editor chatterboss and the whole iheart team we'll be back again next week with another exciting episode of passage to profit and you're listening to iheart radio wor 710 the voice of new york <laughs>